Okay, so welcome. We're going to get started on the first uh, installment of the Collegium Talk series, a series of conversations uh, sponsored by the Helsinki Collegium for Advanced Studies. Um, an advertisement uh, to start off with. We will have a second version, not a version of this, but a second uh, <laughs> Collegium Talk uh, two weeks from now. Uh, what is literature for? Uh, so that will be the same time, uh, 5 o'clock on uh, 29th of March. Uh, today, we are going to be discussing whether there's an upside for unpleasant feelings. And um, in particular, looking at anger, irritation, and anxiety as unpleasant feelings uh, that might have an upside. Um, and... Um, Having a distinguished group of individuals here to have this conversation with us, uh, we have Ani uh, Kayanis, uh, Associate Professor in the Anthropology Program here at the University of Helsinki. Uh, she is also the uh, recent recipient of an ERC and an Academy of Finland grant uh, to study uh, irritation. And then Antti Kaupinen. Uh, also here at the University of Helsinki, a uh, professor of practical philosophy, well known for his work in well-being, moral psychology, and epistemology. I am uh, Charlie Kurth. I'm a professor of philosophy at Western Michigan University in the United States, and I'm here as a fellow at the Helsinki Collegium for a couple of years, working on a book uh, looking at how negative emotions might help make us better people. Um, now, uh, each of us is going to talk a little bit about the emotion uh, that we've spent some time studying. So, Auntie will talk a little bit about anger. Ani will talk a little bit about irritation. I'll talk a little bit about anxiety. And then we'll have, uh, hopefully, a nice conversation with us, with you. Uh, folks who might be uh, uh, streaming uh, can also type in questions uh, to participate. Um, but before we get started, I thought it might be useful to have a little bit of background about emotions. Um, and for, for some emotions, it's, it's really easy to see how they might be good things, while they might be valuable. So happiness, uh, admiration, pride, these things, they, they feel good, right? Uh, other emotions, compassion, love, uh, they're valuable. They connect us with each other in, in really important ways. But then we get to things like anger, anxiety, irritation. Are these valuable? Are these good things to be experiencing? They're definitely unpleasant. So what would make them valuable? Uh, and so that's what we as, as uh, people who think about emotions uh, from an academic perspective um, are really interested in, and some of the questions that we bring to bear when we're thinking about these emotions include things like, well, what is the, the role or job or function that a particular emotion plays? What role does it play evolutionarily or socially in how we interact with the world or with each other? Um, how do people experience their emotions? How does the ways that we experience our emotions, does it, does it differ across times or across cultures or as we change from one situation to another? And then, even if we might be inclined to think that some of these unpleasant feelings and emotions are good things to have, um, they're also problematic and uh, unpleasant. So is there a way for us to blunt the unpleasantness, to make them less costly to us or to others? Um, might there be a way to get the benefits of these emotions without the cost? So might we, um, might we want to swap love for anger as the go-to response when we get insulted? Uh, so those are some questions that we think about as we think about emotions and maybe some things for you guys to keep in mind as uh, we talk about, uh, about anger, irritation, and anxiety. So with that as some introduction, I'm going to turn it over to Auntie, uh, who's going to have some things to say about anger. 
Okay, thanks, Charlie, and thanks, everybody uh, here in the audience and out there in the wilds of the internet who, who might be watching us. Um, so, there's this saying in creative writing programs that write what you know, and maybe that's why I ended up working on anger, being a, a fairly angry person. Yeah, I often get angry when I'm driving a car in particular. That's, that's some of my examples will, will feature just that. That's, for some reason, that's the kind of situation that, that tends to make me angry. All right, so uh, and before I, I go any further, I, sh I should say that all the images here that I'm going to show you are generated with uh, AI programs. Uh, I, I gave them some prompts, and, and this is the kind of things that they they uh, generate for, for anger. Pretty, pretty nice pictures. All right, so first a few words about emotions in general as, as background for the, the way that I understand anger and its role and function. So, so there's this one conception of emotions that, uh, that has been fairly popular in the, in the history of philosophy that sees them as primarily this sort of non-intentional feelings kind of things that happen to us perhaps for physiological causes, that they're kind of like itches that, that may disrupt our agency and prevent us from doing the sort of things that we think are, are best for us. But that's something that uh, is very unpopular these days. People, of course, uh, accept that there is this feeling aspect to emotion, and it's, it is very, very important, and it is is linked to our body. Emotions are essentially embodied. Uh, but there's more to them than, than just some sort of bodily reactions or happenings within us. They also have cognitive and motivational dimensions that are distinctive to different emotions. And in fact, it is those aspects of emotion that are probably uh, the ones that distinguish emotions from each other most clearly. Uh, so. When it comes to the cognitive side of emotions, we can, we can distinguish many different ways in which emotions are, are cognitive. So, so one obvious way is that, that they are based on our beliefs or perceptions of the world. Uh, they are kind of mediated by what we think is happening. We don't respond to what is actually happening, but what we think is, is happening. Uh, our emotions are about something. They are intentional in, in philosophy speak. Uh, so if I'm uh, afraid of a charging dog, then the dog is the object of the emotion. Perhaps more interestingly, uh, many people believe that those emotions targeted at, at particular objects also construe those objects in a, in a certain way. They, they show those objects to us in a certain light. And, and in particular, in an evaluative light, as good or bad in some way. So when, when I'm afraid of a dog that I see running towards me, that, that fear itself uh, construes the dog as, as something dangerous, something that poses a risk of, of harm to something that I care about, in this case, myself. Uh, in addition to kind of having this sort of... Um, making a difference to how things appear to us, uh, they also make a difference to what we pay attention to. Uh, one, one thesis that, that many people accept is that, that positive emotions have a, have, have a role and, and function of, kind of expanding our attention, getting us to explore more of the same sort of things, that, that we, the things that we enjoy or that bring us love. But negative emotions tend to focus our attention on the, on the object of the emotion. So, so if I'm afraid of the dog, other aspects of my surroundings get, get out of view. And this, this, this will have a significant impact on what I go on to, to do. Uh, and that's, that's, of course, because emotions uh, affect, they, they have motivational effects. So they move us to act in a way that makes sense uh, in light of how they construe the, the target of the emotion. If, I, if my fear tells me that, that this is a situation uh, that, that poses a, a risk of, of harm to something I care about, let's say, say myself, uh, then, 
it, it moves me to act in a way that reduces this risk, either running away or maybe shooting the dog if I happen to, to have a gun in my hand. And what's uh, interesting for, for our purposes here is that, that this, this motivation uh, can happen with a degree of independence uh, from what we consciously believe or, or judge to be the best thing to do in the situation or what we ought to do in the situation. That could be uh, for at least two different sort of reasons, because there are different sort of pathways through which emotions move us to act. The one is this more direct sort of pathway in which when we're in the grip of an emotion, uh, they, they motivation bypasses our kind of more rational deliberation. Uh, we, we might act against our judgment. Uh, for example, people who are afraid of flying, they might have convinced themselves that flying is safe, but when they get close to the plane, they just, fear takes them away from, they, they refuse to step on it. But emotions can, and often does have a more subtle effect on our motivation by, by, by way of making a difference to how things appear to us. We come to believe that things are in a certain way because we have an emotion towards them. Come to believe that something is dangerous, for example, and that can make a difference to our action through rational deliberation itself. Okay, so what about anger in, in particular? That's, that's what I, I want to talk about. Now, anger is a, a pretty primitive emotion in its, its most basic form. I, I believe that many animals can get angry, um, infants can get, get angry, and in, in its sort of you might say infantile form, it has this, this sort of structure where uh, when, when uh, we, we get angry when our desires are frustrated. Uh, and, and, you know, then that, that motivates us to, to lash out against those, those obstacles. We'll, we'll come back to the motivation side in a, in a second. But uh, when we acquire uh, more refined capacities, uh, we, we start to get angry for other things that we don't necessarily get angry whenever our desires are frustrated. Rather, anger has to do with the normative expectations that we have of other agents in, in particular. So, uh, we think that people should behave in a certain way or they shouldn't behave in a certain way. So, so in, in the traffic case, if, if somebody cuts in front of us in, in busy traffic, for example, we might get angry with, with that person. And that anger tells us that they did something they, they shouldn't have done. They violated this normative demand that we think is, is legitimate. We also think that, that they are morally responsible for doing so. We wouldn't get angry if, if they uh, couldn't have helped, for example, if, if somebody uh, somebody else was remotely controlling their car. If we knew that, then we wouldn't be angry with the, with the driver. Yeah. Uh, so, what about motivation? Well, if emotions motivate us to do the sort of things that make sense in the light of the way that things appear through them, then it obviously makes sense that anger uh, motivates us to make the obstacles go away when it's about frustrated desires. But when it, when it is about violated normative expectations, and what it motivates us to do is engage in the sort of behavior that, that forces the other person to comply with it. Uh, and, and that can amount to many different things depending on the context. So I might just shout at the other driver, you know, don't do that. Uh, it might not make any actual difference, but, but that's the kind of thing that I feel moved to do when I'm, when I'm angry. Uh, and as, as we know, it can, can motivate people to, to get violent in order to uh, make, uh, make sure that, that people stop doing the things that they think they, they shouldn't be doing. Uh, and they can, uh, it can also get people to, uh, uh, to punish somebody afterwards for, for having, having done something. And this, this, I think, often has to do with the fact that uh, when people violate what we think are legitimate normative expectations, they're kind of setting themselves above others. They're acting as if they are more important or somehow better than other people, and so they can get away with taking other people's stuff or cutting in front of them in traffic and so on. 
and the, and the function of, of punishment is to kind of bring their status down to, to where we think it, it belongs. And one important thing here about anger in, in particular uh, is that this, this motivation to, uh, to force people to comply with the norms or to, to, to punish them for their past violation is relatively insensitive to the costs that it has to, to us and other things, other things that we care about. So, so, you know, we're willing to say, when I'm really angry with somebody for, for uh, say, cutting in front of me in traffic, I might get out of the car, I might, even if they're you know, much bigger person than I am, I might start, you know, arguing with them, saying rude things to them, you know, fighting with them. Uh, it's, it, it doesn't matter that, that if I thought things through, I would uh, decide that this is a bad idea. Uh, anger is not, not sensitive to, to that sort of thing. And, and that's one reason why many philosophers have found anger to be a particularly problematic negative emotion. Perhaps most uh, famous treatise on, on anger in, in the history of philosophy uh, was written by the Roman Stoic Seneca, uh, who characterized anger as, as a form of madness. And, and he, he, he listed a lot of features that, that anger shares with kind of madness. That it, it, it is devoid of self-control, it, it's regardless of decorum, it's deaf to reason and advice, it's excited by trifling causes, it's awkward at perceiving what is true and what is just. And people like Martin Nussbaum have, have made similar sort of criticisms. So there's a number of things that are, are going on in these critics, but, but the basic idea is, is that, uh, so on the one hand, there's this loss of self-control. On the other hand, there's this kind of unreasonableness that we get angry about things that are not, not worth it. Uh, and then it, it, it might involve some sort of... Uh, uh, the magical thinking that as if by getting angry, by, by hurting other people, we could balance the cosmic scales and, and, uh, and make everything all right again. Uh, nevertheless, people have also argued that anger has, has benefits. Uh, so one kind of benefit that anger might have is an epistemic one, and this has to do with, the, with its feature of, of making it seem to us that things are in a, in a certain way. And, and in particular, to do so even when, it, when we judge otherwise or ourselves. Uh, so uh, this is going to be the case in, in particular uh, when our conscious and, and, and rational judgments have been shaped by some oppressive forces, for, for example. So we've come to think of uh, ourselves as not being entitled to certain sort of treatment. For example, if we belong to a kind of uh, minority that has been discriminated against historically, perhaps we think that this is the kind of treatment. We, we have internalized norms to say that it's okay to treat us in that way. But in spite of that, kind of in spite of ourselves, we might find ourselves getting angry because of that sort of treatment. And in, in that sort of cases, ang anger is what Alison Jagger has labeled an outlaw emotion, an emotion that, that kind of goes against our own, own judgment. But it can actually be sensitive to genuine uh, reasons uh, for, for thinking that what other people are doing is, is not morally acceptable, that we are being treated unjustly. Uh, anger can also have motivational benefits. Uh, if, if we, and, and this of course is highlighted in, in the sort of context where there's some sort of systemic problems that are very difficult to address and, and, and to, to change. There's, there's a big cost often to initiating uh, change, in, in, change in a system that, that is, is well entrenched. Uh, and, and in that, those situations, like rational calculation might tell us, especially as, as individuals, that, that it, it's a good idea not, not to, to make a fuss, to, uh, to submit to those, 
those norms and expectations that other people have of us, even if we think that they are unjust. But if we're angry, uh, because anger kind of influences our deliberation, can sometimes bypass it, uh, because it's insensitive to the costs that uh, this action that it motivates can impose on us, it can get us to act even in, in those situations. Uh, it, it functions then as a commitment device, as, as psychologists sometimes like to say. And one, one role that it has is that if people know that we are going to, to get angry about something, even if it's costly to us, then they don't uh, act in, an, uh, in a way that wrongs us in the, in the first place. They, they, they don't want to face an, an angry person, so, so they don't treat us badly. Now, I myself have argued that there's a further uh, kind of value to, to anger beyond these potential epistemic and motivational benefits. Uh, and, and that is that anger can be part of valuing things properly. So when we talk about valuing, sometimes we might think of you know, just uh, believing that something is good or, or that it's bad or whatever. But, uh, but I think that really valuing does involve a whole suite of emotional reactions to something. So, so if you value the, uh, the Great Barrier Reef in, in, in Australia, then your valuing it is manifest in part by the, that fact that when there's news, as there have been recently, that, that it is dying or it is doing badly, that makes you feel sad or makes, makes you feel bad in some way. And when there's news that, that it, it has recovered, which is actually the, the most the latest news that I've heard, then you feel good about that. Those feelings kind of manifest and constitute valuing it as the sort of thing that it is. But I think that for many ways of valuing, anger is also a constituent of, of properly valuing things. And it goes even for the Great Barrier Reef, that if somebody uh, pollutes the ocean or, or does nothing about CO2 emissions that are you know, changing the acidity of, of, of the ocean and then killing the, the barrier reef, that makes you angry if you care about the, the Great Barrier Reef. Or, or to put it the other way, if, if it doesn't make you angry in any way, then that, that shows that you don't really value it as, as much as you, you could. And I've argued that this is in particular a part of respect, that, that you, if you respect something, then you, you must be disposed to get angry for certain kind of treatment of the object of your respect. This is, this is something that is often highlighted in cases of self-respect. That if you respect yourself, then you don't let people treat you uh, in a demeaning fashion, for example, without getting angry about it. Yeah. That getting angry about it shows that you, you have self-respect. So the final thing I want to, want to say is that uh, even though I think anger can have a number of, of benefits in spite of being an, an unpleasant emotion. Uh, I think that those benefits are contingent on, on anger being based on valuing the sort of things that are worth valuing and valuing them in, in, the, in the right way. So it is true, I think, that anger is often misdirected and it often has bad consequences because we do tend to value some things too little and some things too much. We, we might might have a sense of entitlement that is not warranted. And then we get angry for things that are not actually slights or that are not actually uh, bad treatment of, of ourselves. We might get angry at things that we shouldn't get angry at because we have false beliefs about them. Uh, sometimes we get angry for reasons that have nothing to do with valuing. For example, because we're tired and stressed and hungry. That's, that's Usually why I get angry with, with our kids is, is because, because of something that has nothing to do with their actual behavior. And finally, anger does have this tendency, because it is insensitive to costs and, and to, to a degree independent of our, our conscious deliberation, it can get out of hand, it can result in this sort of self-reinforcing process that, that doesn't stop when the, when the problem has already been corrected. So that's why I think Ultimately, ang anger is one of those emotions that, that highlights the importance of developing a kind of virtue, of, of, of loving the things that are actually good, that are actually worth loving, 
and respecting the things that are actually worth respecting. We, if, if we don't value the, the right things, then uh, we won't be able to enjoy the epistemic and motivational benefits of, of anger, but it, it instead turns out to be a, a, a very problematic emotion. Thank you. Okay, we will now turn to Ani to talk about irritation. Okay, so anger uh, is a powerful emotion and it's connected to something that is quite important. So if I go back to the example that Antti gave about somebody cutting in front of us in the traffic, that it's not only that we get angry because they are breaking a norm, but we also get angry because it's potentially dangerous, so it's life-threatening. But what if somebody cuts in front of us when we are getting on the bus or uh, on, uh, getting on public transport? It's not life-threatening. Uh, if we live in Finland, we are still likely to even get a seat. But it's annoying, right? So let's talk about an, another negative emotion uh, that is mild and connected to these things that are actually not that important, so irritation. Uh, so the things that we get irritated by, uh, irritation by definition is a, is a mild emotion and some often is actually uh, understood as a mild form of anger, but it can also connect to other emotions such as disgust or uh, frustration or even envy. Uh, our neighbor has a nice car and every time we see that car, uh, it just annoys us a little bit. Here it's connected to uh, envy rather than anger. But... Uh, so by definition, it's something uh, that is not that important and it's mild, but there's another characteristic of irritation that actually can make it quite a powerful thing, and that is that it's repetitive. So especially, so we get annoyed with the, in these fleeting encounters with strangers. Uh, we also get irritated by sensory, uh, uh, as a response to sensory irritants, so for example, loud noises and bad smells. But what's quite interesting about irritation is that we, we seem to be particularly prone to irritation in our closest relationships. So if we think about our siblings, our spouses, partners, our close colleagues, uh, and so on, this is where irritation seems to be uh, especially prevalent in these relationships. So it's not only that we get irritated by, for example, uh, disgu disgusting sounds, but for example, we get particularly powerfully irritated by, by the way our parent eats. And I'm not oversharing here, we actually did research and asked people <laughs> about these things. But if you think about, for example, children uh, with their siblings, uh, or us with our partners or parents, we can, we can have these relationships that uh, continue over decades, and we continue to kind of exist in this chronic state of mild irritation in these relationships. And it doesn't mean that these are not functional, that these are dysfunctional relationships. They can be perfectly functional and, uh, and uh, good relationships. But it's, it just seems that uh, human sociality is really uh, permeated uh, by irritation. And uh, what makes irritation, even though it's a mild emotion, uh, it can be, become quite a powerful one it's the repetitive character, uh, characteristic of it. So we get irritated by our partner uh, loading the dishwasher in the wrong way. This doesn't really matter, but when it happens uh, 300 times, uh, it starts to annoy us. And there's been some research on uh, irritation in romantic relationships, and it's a little bit discouraging because what they found uh, is that it's often the traits that initially ha people have found attractive in the other person <laughs> that over time becomes social allergens uh, through uh, repetitive uh, exposure. So if we think about these eliciting conditions, uh, what gives rise to irritation, there are a few characteristics there. And one of them is goal obstruction. So we have a goal that we are trying to, for example, get to work on time, but it's been snowing last night, uh, or something, our partner, is, our colleague is late, or something like that. So that elicits irritation as a response. Norm violations that Antti just talked about, so I'm not going to go in too much into that. But irritation is also uh, a mechanism of cooperation and a, it's a moral emotion. So one of its functions is to uphold moral norms. 
And then uh, these are especially uh, these uh, these eliciting conditions, like they they cut across all our kind of range of relationships uh, with strangers uh, at the supermarket to our close colleagues and our partners. But this uh, social allergens that mostly applies to our closest, most intimate relationships. So it's quite easy to see how irritation can be a threat to our cooperative relationships. Uh, so this repetition uh, leads to escalation of uh, moderate events uh, or irritants. So for example, irritation, uh, it builds up over time and can lead to be connected to these quite traumatic events down the line, such as incidents of road rage or uh, divorce and so on. Uh, it also has an emotional burden on individuals, and uh, people in our research have report connected it to also physiological dimensions, such as uh, insomnia and, uh, and stress. And then it puts a burden on our relationships uh, by creating... Uh, bringing in distance uh, and also conflict. And one quite interesting thing about irritation also compared to other, some other emotions is that it seems to elicit counter-irritation. So if you think about, and this is not true of all emotions, if you, for example, think about fear, uh, if you are afraid of somebody and you display that, it doesn't make that person afraid of you. But if you are irritated with somebody and you display that, uh, they... Uh, in some uh, occasions, they will get irritated back at you. So, uh, and this was, uh, for example, in our interviews uh, that we've done in, uh, in Finland, in China, uh, and in the US, uh, when people were talking about their, their irritation, their experiences of irritation in their, uh, re in their relationships with their partners and spouses, for example, people would try to manage uh, their own irritation not to uh, display it, not to show it, uh, because they knew that their partner will get irritated at them if they show their own irritation. And I think uh, one of the reasons why irritation seems to like, breed irritation uh, is because it also seems to be one of our go-to emotions when there's another, even more unpleasant emotion that we find it difficult to face. For example, shame. So just imagine uh, I am in your... I'm in a li library uh, with my rowdy kids, and I, we start to, I start to just read uh, from the crowd uh, that we are irritating others. I might get irritated uh, because it's so uncomfortable for me, uh, for me to uh, experience the underlying emotion of shame. Mm -hmm. So, this kind of... Uh, how irritation is a threat to cooperation, it's a kind of burdensome, uh, it's quite easy to see, but it also, for something to evolve in humans uh, as such a pervasive feature of our everyday sociality, it really suggests that we need it for something. It's doing something beneficial uh, and something productive in our relationships. Uh, and one of them we already talked about, and Antti also talked about in relation to anger, uh, so these negative emotions, they work as a punishment. Uh, when we display uh, negative emotion, uh, it works as a punishment and also preemptively prevents uh, breaking of social norms. So if I go over my 15 minutes here, uh, at some point I'm likely to start seeing some uh, signs of irritation in the audience. Or maybe in this case they will be directed to Charlie, <laughs> who is not chairing <laughs> ag uh, aggressively. But... Uh, then both of us will take that sign and maybe next time I will make sure to time my talk uh, or Charlie will be more uh, assertive. But uh, if we think about other benefits of irritation is that it's, it can, because of its mild uh, fi kind of uh, characteristic, it can be understood as a kind of early warning sign. So we are scanning our environment uh, and here I'm talking about social relations mostly. Uh, we are scanning our environment for potential threats and imbalances, that something is off, something could be better, uh, and irritation is one of those mechanisms that keeps us awake. Uh, so we are scanning for imbalances, inequities in our relationships, and as a kind of early warning sign, when things are not really that bad yet. 
And it's also kind of mild everyday policing in our relationships. So we intentionally also, in our research, we've also found in all these three countries, we intentionally irritate our closest others. Uh, both adults and children do this. And, uh, and we display our irritation uh, to bring up issues with our partners and so on. Then something at the kind of a bit more abstract level is that relationships uh, between people require some emotional intensity. So we are drawn to some emotional intensity. It doesn't really matter whether it's positive or negative at this, uh, at this abstract level. But uh, this kind of er everyday cycle of mild uh, positive negative emotions is part of that. And then and this is also something that Antti touched upon in, uh, in your thinking about the value, uh, value and anger, the relationship between value and anger. So it can be seen as an investment into uh, the relationships that matter to us. So we get annoyed with people that matter to us. Or maybe we are more likely to display our irritation uh, rather than, for example, uh, uh, use avoidance as a coping mechanism when it's, when it's in a relationship that matters. So, to finish off, uh, if we just start from this understanding that, okay, uh, irritation is something that evolved in humans as, uh, as beneficial, there's no getting away from it, uh, we need it for something, uh, so it doesn't mean that it's not burdensome. It's burdensome, uh, it puts a burden on an individual, and it also uh, can be burdensome uh, to communities. And, uh, for example, there's been some research uh, in these multi-ethnic neighborhoods uh, in Sydney, uh, in Jakarta, where about situations uh, where negative affects or negative emotions uh, arise. And uh, these are anthropologists, uh, Amanda Weiss. And uh, her, her finding was that it really... So first of all, the first, uh, first finding is that we tend to get irritated by people who are different from us. And it really goes down to these very mundane, detailed uh, micro-behaviors, such as how people greet each other, what kind of food, uh, how, uh, what's the, the, how their food smells, uh, how, they, how people manage the social distance, uh, so how close somebody stands to you next to, uh, next to you at the supermarket, and so on. So if you think about what, what kind of benefit irritation has here, none. Because in, in this kind of environment, it's not like everybody's going to adhere to uh, the same social norms uh, in, at the level of these micro-behaviors. That's not going to happen. So actually, irritation is not doing anything productive here. It's a burden. So in, in that sense, clarifying, so if we think about, it's difficult to manage at the kind of neighborhood level or community level, but if you think about, for example, work communities uh, with colleagues, uh, especially when there's a lot of diversity or the community is going through a transition, uh, the one way of reducing irritation is to clarify the areas where social norms uh, are very important, uh, should be shared to a high degree. So what are these core areas where it matters that we share the same values or social norms? And then also be very clear about, rather than coming up with more and more rules that everybody needs to adhere to, also protect those areas where it's important to protect uh, diverse norms and practices. And then to have real channels for impact, uh, because irritation can be, as a kind of collective irritation, it can be seen as the going into this category of so-called weapons of the weak. So this is James, uh, anthropologist uh, same James Scott's uh, idea, uh, notion uh, that he, he coined with, uh, with his research on class conflict in rural Malaysia. And these weapons of the weak are practices that people, uh, people rely on when they are not really real channels for impact. So for example, uh, sabotage, food tracking, evasion, pretending to be ignorant, uh, irritation talk, and so on. And then at the individual level, uh, how to reduce the burden of experiencing irritation? Well, first of all, 
uh, it can be a bit liberating to understand that this is something we need and we have a lot to thank for, rather than uh, we don't need, it's not an emotion that we need to get rid of. Uh, irritation is very co closely connected, has this very strong uh, physiological dimension. So soothing, soothing the sensory se sensitivity can actually be quite, uh, play a role in managing irritability. And then, of course, at the level of uh, interpreting the emotion, we can uh, stop to think, if we, if we understand irritation as something that gives us motivation and uh, motivation and protection, we can stop to think like, okay, uh, if, uh, if I got the wrong, somebody coughed in my coffee uh, on the elevator, uh, is this something that comes so close to my core self and the things that really matter? It might be, I'm not saying that it's not, but uh, this is for all of us to stop and think about. Do I need the motivation and the protection that irritation is providing, or can I let it go in this instance? Thank you. I'm delighted to hear that irritation at your partner can be a sign of a healthy relationship. <laughs> delighted. Uh, so we're switching to anxiety. Uh, and I want to start off, I guess I take it that we're all familiar with anxiety um, in one way or another. But I wanted to uh, start off with uh, three examples of anxiety as we experience it. Um, and then uh, try and draw some, some lessons from the examples. So, first example is um, from, uh, there's, a, there's a genre of books, the anxiety memoir, and this is from one of, uh, one of these books. Uh, Scott Stossel, he's, a, uh, he's an editor for a, a major U.S. magazine, The Atlantic. He wrote this book, My Age of Anxiety, where he talks about his struggles with anxiety and, and the cascade of troubles, some funny, some sad, that it brings. And so there's, there's one part of the book where he's talking about the... Um, the anxiety he had on his wedding day. So, you know, the hour is, has, has, has arrived, right? And he's so incredibly anxious that he's locked himself in his uh, soon-to-be parent-in-law's bathroom. He's sweating, he's shaking, he's vomiting, he's taking shots of vodka to try and manage the anxiety that he's experiencing. Clearly, the wedding had to get delayed so that he could be sober and <laughs> consent <laughs> to the marriage. Uh, but that's an example, and it's uh, of, of, of anxiety is really going wrong. Uh, and though I hope no one here has had that kind of fit with anxiety, it's familiar enough uh, that we can see that anxiety has this really sort of powerfully bad side. So second example is completely mundane. It's the anxiety of our everyday life. Um, you have a job interview coming up. You have to give a talk at the Think Center, uh, right? And you might be a little bit anxious about these looming events. Um, and as a result of your anxiety, you're like, ah, you know, I should probably go over my job spiel one more time. I should probably look at my lecture notes one more time. And, and lo and behold, you, you catch an error, right? Like, ooh, that would have been embarrassing. And that was, that's anxiety and they're like, phew, it was a good thing I was worried, like, got me to go back and avoid something that could have been unfortunate. Third example is comes out, I mean, you can find various ones of these. They come from autobiographies of people like Martin Luther King Jr., uh, Nelson Mandela, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who was a, a suffragist in the U.S. Um, and I'll, I'll focus on the Stanton case because I think her case is particularly interesting. Uh, so in her autobiography, uh, she talks about the, the very significant anxiety that she experienced about getting married, and it's not like the Stossel kind of anxiety, right? It's, um, it's this woman who is in love with a man, right? She wants to get married, 
Uh, but she's a suffragist. She is fighting for women's rights. And at the time, uh, early 1900s, uh, in the U.S., the institution of marriage is an institution that is deeply misogynistic, right? You are literally becoming a piece of property of your husband. And so she is there, anxious about how can I get married to this man given the values as a suffragist that I stand for? How do I reconcile love and cause. Like she's really worried about it. You see it in her autobiography. And as a result of her anxiety, she's um, more attuned to this issue and she seeks advice from her sister and from her father and, and from her fiance. And she comes to see how, at least in this case, marriage to this man, given our understanding of what's at stake, can be done. So there's a way to reconcile these, at least initially seeming to be, incompatible values that was driven, at least in part, by the anxiety that she experienced. So those are the three examples. And what I want to do is try and extract three observations or use them to make three observations about anxiety and its potential upside. So the first one is that if we really want to understand anxiety and its value, we need to look at the big picture. So oftentimes when we're thinking about anxiety, given the kinds of critters we are, we're thinking about like the stossel kinds of cases, the, the disasters, right? That's what we're thinking about when we're thinking about anxiety. And if, if we do that, we're going to get a really distorted picture about what this emotion is and how we tend to experience it. We overlook the mundane cases, the Stanton kinds of cases. Um, uh, and we instead see anxiety as this pathological or near pathological kind of phenomena. And that's, that's, I think, problematic because that's not how most of us experience anxiety most of the time. So that's just a distorted picture. To help you, to help see, drive home, like, why that matters... Consider an example. Uh, consider eco-anxiety. Eco-anxiety is the kind of anxiety that we feel about um, pending um, environmental catastrophes, so things like climate change, right? So the American Psychological Association, this is the professional governing body for uh, psychologists in North America, it's defined eco-anxiety, and here I'm quoting, chronic fear of environmental doom, right? So that's the definition of anxiety. It's making into a pathology uh, anxiety. So if you're worried about climate change, by this definition, you are suffering from a mental disorder, or it seems to be pushing us in that direction. And that on its own is problematic, but the, the problem is actually worse. It's deeper because as a statistical matter, the individuals who are more likely to experience and express their anxiety about climate change are women and minorities. So now we've got a situation where this understanding of eco-anxiety in a pathological way now has the ability to further marginalize individuals who are already marginalized. And that's making a bad thing even worse. Right? So larger lesson here, keep an eye on the bigger picture. Understand or try and understand, keep in mind that anxiety isn't just these uh, disastrous kinds of cases. So that was the first, the first thing I wanted to, to mention. The second thing I wanted to mention is uh, that anxiety can be valuable, and it can be invaluable in, in interestingly different ways. So think back about the, the mundane cases, the job interview or the, the, the giving a talk kinds of anxieties or the, the Stanton kinds of anxiety about getting married. And these kinds of cases, anxiety is instrumentally valuable. It's helping me giving my talk, Stanton making, reconciling her values, it's helping us make better decisions and choices about whether I should practice my talk one more time or whether uh, my competing values, love and marriage can, or love and cause, can be reconciled. 
So there we have a case, uh, or cases, of anxiety being instrumentally valuable, helping us achieve our goals and our aims. But I think the Stanton case is interesting because it suggests that anxiety can be valuable in a, in a deeper kind of way. Uh, it can be intrinsically valuable. And the idea here is that being anxious reflects well on you. It says something about your character, about how you are properly emotionally attuned with the kinds of things that matter. And we see this in the, the Stanton case. She's worried about something that really is worrisome. How do I reconcile my potentially or seemingly conflicting values, marriage and suffrage, right? And it's in part because she is worried about this worrisome issue that we admire her. She's admirable because she is worried about this. And in, in some sense, we might, be, we might admire her less if she was like, oh, you know, love, cause, not that big a deal, right? And so like, that she's worried matters. So anxiety uh, can be valuable, and it seems like a couple of different ways. It helps us make better cho choices, pursue our goals and aims, but it also might just reflect well on us. Third thing that I wanted to talk about was how anxiety can go bad in all kinds of ways, right? We can be anxious when we shouldn't be. We can be anxious about sort of trivial things like how we look or uh, how we talk. Uh, we can not be anxious when we should be, so we're probably not feeling enough eco-anxiety uh, given how large the, well, maybe Finland's different. In America, we're probably not eco-anxiety enough. Maybe Finns are uh, more properly emotionally attuned, uh, at least from what I've seen. And we, the anxiety we feel uh, can also just be too strong. It might be, we might be feeling it about the right thing, so like test anxiety. Test anxiety, tests are worrisome, and so it might be appropriate to feel anxiety about a test, but the amount of anxiety that we feel can be way too high, and then we can blow the test. And so what's interesting, I think, at least about anxiety, is that for all three of these kinds of problems, there are things that we can do to at least help us manage the issue. And I'll just give one example. Um, so a uh, psychologist, Jamie Jamison, I think he's at North, uh, Northwestern in the United States, he, uh, he did a study uh, on American college students who were preparing to take the SAT college exam. So this is an exam that helps you, helps determine like what college you're gonna go to in. So it's like a high stake kind of test. Uh, and so uh, people practice it. And so he had two groups of students one just took a practice SAT test, and the other, before they took the test, read a little paragraph, like seven sentences, something like that. And it said something like this, like, hey, you're about to take the practice SAT. You might be anxious, but don't worry. Research shows that anxiety helps focus the mind, uh, and so if you're anxious, that's a probably a good thing. You're likely to do better on the test. And as a result of just reading those few sentences, the individuals who read those sentences ended up doing better on the practice SAT test than the people who didn't have the little paragraph. But wait, there's more, because what was even cooler is this tiny little intervention with reading like a seven sentence paragraph had effects three months later when the students took the real SAT. The students who had taken, who had read the little paragraph, just that one little invention had effects three months later when they took the real thing. They continued to perform better. So that's really interesting. If we understand our emotions, if we understand how they can be used beneficially, then maybe that's a way for us to better channel them so that we can get the good and maybe help protect against some of the bad. So those are the three points that I wanted to talk about. What I think we're going to do now is... Uh, uh, Annie, Auntie, and I uh, are going to sort of talk with each other about what we said um, and uh, then open it up to questions uh, from you guys. But there's sort of like 
enrich the conversation if while we're talking, you want to add on to something we're saying, raise one finger. If you have like a full-blown question of your own, not related to what we're saying, raise your hand. Do not abuse the rule. Don't try and use the finger to get one of these, right? Because then auntie will get angry. Annie will get irritated, and I'll just be a mess, okay? <laughs> so those are the rules, uh, and I'll get us started with a question uh, for Auntie and Annie. And it's a question that goes like this, guys. So both of you talked about how irritation and anger can help us in various ways protect our values. And so then the question is, like, do we need both emotions? Do we need both irritation and anger? So for instance, could we get by with less anger and more irritation? Um, or just irritation and no anger? Thoughts? Yeah. Um, I, think, uh, I think there's uh, one difference between irritation and anger is definitely the strength of the response uh, to a situation. And I think uh, anger, as you said, uh, it leaves no choice for, it leaves no room for deliberation in some situations. Whereas in, with irritation, I guess uh, there is more room for deliberation. So, for example, interpreting our emotional response, mm -hmm. whether this is something that we, uh, this, there's of, of course massive uh, cultural variance in uh, the coping mechanisms and also the display rules ranging from anything like public fights that everybody in the village comes to witness to this. Yeah? So uh, there's a lot of, uh, I think in irritation, uh, I think they are functionally different uh, okay. in terms of like the strength of uh, the response to and the severity of the eliciting conditions. Yeah, I, I, I agree with, with all of that. So imagine that there's the... You know, the, the school bully once again, you know, throws chewing gum in your hair. Uh, if you're irritated by that, you're probably not going to stand up and, you know, make it clear that that's not okay. But if you're angry, that's, that's what you'll do. I, I, I remember this particular instance when I was in school. <laughs> I, I kicked the biggest guy in class because he, he threw something at me and I was like, and he stopped doing it. This this was a happy ending <laughs> <laughs> to, the, to the story, but it you know could have happened and another way around. And I don't think I don't think irritation would have done that stuff, that that job. Uh, and, I, and I also it's I'm equally confident that anger won't do all of the jobs that irritation does. If if we if we think of this sort of kind of management of our individual difference in relationships. Mm -hmm which seems to be one of the jobs that irritation is doing. Uh, if, if you got really angry every time your, your partner puts the toilet paper roll in the wrong way, which my wife all, does all the time, uh, that wouldn't be a very good relationship. Uh, but if you get irritated, you know, maybe you can make these micro adjustments to each other's behavior so that you can both relax and, and, and be confident that uh, they will up. <laughs> Uh, I actually wanted to ask uh, something about anxiety mm. uh, in terms of uh, what happens when people uh, display or show anxiety uh, to each other. And uh, you, yeah, you mentioned this, uh, how we can, for example, uh, soothe the anxiety uh, by relatively small actions. Oh, yeah. But uh, do, you have any, do you have any thoughts on uh, what does it do in a relationship uh, the display of anxiety. Good. Um, so it can go one of, one of two ways. So anxiety in, in a lot of ways is like fear or disgust in the sense that it's contagious. So if I see that you're disgusted by what's on your plate, I'm also going to feel disgusted. And if I see that um, you're afraid, then I'm... Uh, also going to start to feel at least initial tremblings of fear. And anxiety, at least in some occasions, seems to be contagious in that way. If I see that you're anxious, uh, then I'm, in, I'm likely to get a little bit anxious too. Um, that said, in other contexts, um, 
mentoring context, context where there's uh, differences in status or role uh, that are particularly salient in those kinds of situations. Someone's getting anxious, another person uh, can be, can, can help mellow that by helping the anxious individual see that what they're worried about is they're too worried uh, or that the worry is uh, well-placed, but their strategies for um, uh, still succeeding on the test or, or something like that. Uh, so they're, they're really interesting um, situational differences there. Yeah, and uh, it makes me think of these uh, other so-called negative emotions, what they do in our relationships when we display them. And I'm thinking specifically the work of uh, a postdoc uh, who is in my project, Fang Min Tsui, uh, who's done for her PhD project, she, she studied the emotion of disappointment in romantic uh, relationships. Hmm. And th the main, main finding that they had in that research was that actually disappointment uh, when we detect disappointment in our romantic partner, it motivates us. Uh, this, was uh, this was done in the US, so in that context, it motivates uh, people to do this like re uh, uh, pro-social relationship work. And yeah. that's not true for all emotions. I don't no. know if we detect anger in our, uh, for example, partner, if that motivates us for proactively uh, working for the relationship or whether it, for example, motivates uh, fear or uh, irritation or something else, but, but this is uh, quite yeah. interesting. One, one emotion where it works very differently would be disgust. So to feel disgust towards another um, seems to cognitively in the person experiencing the disgust um, mark that individual as irreparably damaged. And so to, to feel disgust towards uh, an intimate, uh, a partner, or family member, or something like that, um, that's going to be a really hard one to recover from. Whereas anger uh, doesn't seem to, uh, the disgust doesn't respond to reasons. So if I am disgusted uh, at um, uh, my mother's behavior, uh, she's not going to be able to explain it away in a way that repairs the situation. Whereas if I'm angry at my mother's behavior, then understanding that like what I'm mad about wasn't her fault or something like that will mitigate the anger and potentially get the relationship back on track. So really interesting differences here. Uh, can I ask you guys a, a, a different sort of question that, that came to my mind when I was listening to, to your presentation? So. Um, Aristotle has this concept of the of the phronimos, of the fully virtuous person, or the practically wise person, and and he famously emphasizes that the the fully virtuous person isn't just somebody who always does the right thing in 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 each individual situation, but also feels the right way and to the right extent in in, in different situations. So. So the, the fully virtuous person will feel some degree of fear in a dangerous situation. Uh, and they will also feel angry when somebody is being treated unjustly and so on. Do you think that a fully virtuous person would ever be irritated or anxious? I, I felt from what you were saying that you, you kind of thought that a fully virtuous person would be anxious in certain situations. But I confess I'm, I'm, I'm a little skeptical of, of that. But what, what do you guys think? Go ahead, Henry. Um, well, I do think irritation is a moral emotion in a sense that uh, and one of the... Uh, so I do research on human cooperation more generally, and uh, one of the things that is very, you know, interesting question in cooperation studies is uh, punishment, and specifically third-party punishment. So humans so far... Uh, there's very little findings in other species except for humans. Uh, for willingness to engage in third-party punishment, especially when it's costly. And what that means is that uh, we interfere uh, when we see a norm violation, even if when we are not the direct, uh, you know, the victim of the school bully, for example, but we interfere when we see somebody else bullied. So that's third-party punishment. And uh, I think irritation 
uh, irritation is connected to that. Uh, so in that sense, it's a virtuous emotion. But also at the same time, it does seem to be irritability is not really a virtue. Like it's, uh, it's considered a weakness in many cultural contexts. And uh, for example, my research in China, uh, a person of high status, a very high value is placed on capacity to control emotional impulse, impulses. And if you are, uh, if you are of high status and not able to get irritated, I'm very irritable, those two things don't really go together. So I, I, I imagine that at least some Aristotelians might say that, that uh, the, the fully virtuous person would, would act out of a sense of justice to, you know, inflict third party punishment on, on somebody. So it's, it's kind of, uh, it has this positive role for, for us imperfect <laughs> creatures, but, but, uh, but, it's, but if it's the case that the fully virtuous person wouldn't have that, then it's not kind of in itself a virtuous response. Okay, so then that would mean that uh, virtue is connected to like moral deliberation rather than this like fast track moral emotions where we just act on things, make moral judgments on the basis of emotions. That, that is a big, big question, <laughs> I, I, I think. Uh, uh, and I, I, I worry that if we, <laughs> I have to say something <laughs> about that. But so, so I think that in in that sort of classical Aristotelian picture, the uh, the the virtuous person doesn't necessarily act out of deliberation. That that they their uh, quick emotional responses are all are also attuned to reasons. Uh, it's just that that they won't. Uh, there are some emotions that they, they never have because they are not they're not strictly speaking necessary to motivate people to act in the in the right way or, or to relate to other people in the in the right way. Uh, but they so irritation could in principle at least be this one of those emotions that that uh, can be replaced by by something else without without loss, but uh, in the case of us actual flawed humans there might be nothing else that, that actually actually plays that role. But let's hear what Charlie has to say. So I think more. that uh, Aristotle doesn't think, think some emotions the virtuous person would never experience. So the, the virtuous person would never experience shame because they would never, they're virtuous, they would never do anything shameful. Um, it's less clear to me that the virtuous person wouldn't feel irritation unless they were only surrounded by other virtuous people. Because if they were surrounded by only virtuous people, then nobody's doing annoying things, and so there's no cause to be justifiably irritated. But if the virtuous person is surrounded by less than virtuous people, then they're going to be doing irritable things. And so the appropriate yeah. emotional response could be, could be irritation. Yeah. And I think something similar is going to hold for the, the case of anxiety. Right, so if if we assume that the, which I think is Aristotle's view, that the fully virtuous person isn't omniscient, uh, then there are going to be situations where the virtuous person um, isn't certain about what they should do, and so and those are the very kinds of cases where you should be anxious. You should be worried because you're uncertain about what to do. And one of the functions, at least as I think about anxiety, uh, that it performs is gets you to reflect in ways that help you resolve the uncertainty that you experience. Yeah. I, I guess the, the, the question I have is whether, I, I think in those situations, a virtuous person would have a desire to find out what the right thing to do is. And they would be highly motivated to, to explore uh, to, to consider the reasons for and against acting in a particular way. But would it, does it have to have that negative feel to it that, that, that yeah. goes with anxiety? It, uh, that, that's, that's what I'm a little less, less Good. sure so of. I mean, well, I mean, so like for Aristotle in particular, I mean, uh, he thinks that virtuous action is a function of three things. You have correct beliefs about what needs to happen you have correct motivations about how to address it, and you have the correct feelings. Yeah. And so in these kinds of cases, you want to get the right answer. You know you're uncertain, and you should be anxious as a result. 
that's going to be the emotion that seems to be the relevant one. Yeah. I guess some might think that, well, you can calmly consider those in a way that doesn't involve that. But, but also, on the irritation point, I, I guess may, maybe my, my skepticism about the virtue and irritation reflects that some stoic leanings. So I'm, I'm thinking that the stoic sta sage uh, wouldn't be irritated by the toilet paper roll being one way or the, or the other. That, that, because uh, Stoics emphasize that a that lot of people's both negative and positive emotions concern things that are not actually important. That, uh, what is really important is just that we, we lead a virtuous life. Or, I, I, I don't think that they're, they're correct about it. I think other things like, like justice uh, realized in the, in, in the world or not does, does matter as well, and we should have responses to that. Uh, but, uh, but I guess irritation typically has to do with those, those small things that, that at least the Stoics would say yeah. we shouldn't care about which, whichever way they go. Yeah, I think uh, in many cultural contexts there's definitely a lot of emphasis on uh, control of emotional impulse, impulses uh, as a part of becoming a fully mature uh, ethical person. So, uh, but there's a lot of variance. So, uh, so it's not as emphasized in some contexts as in others. I had a question that for, for you, Annie, that's going to sort of shift us a little bit. Um, but maybe pause to see if anyone wants to comment on stuff that we've been chatting about. OK. Yeah. I think there's a microphone that's going to come around so that everybody can hear what you have to say. Yes, I was thinking about the anger. Actually, it was really nice that you, you talk about the positive parts of the anger, that why do we need it? Because I practice my self-stillness, and I try to not react to the, to the moment, whatever triggers me, and I, what I, I'm only practicing, so I'm, I don't know what is, what is the right way to react to the situations, but I can realize that I'm getting angry, and I'm like, okay, I'm not going to react this time, and I didn't react. I didn't get angry at all. I just listened and I left the place. But what I felt later was that I felt like I didn't protect myself from it. So like I let myself get hurt. Like I, I felt like I was not respecting my own self in the end. So like you said, yeah. all of these anxiety, irritation and anger, the only reason we are blocking them is because we think it's negative, which is actually not. When, when it's like on the right time, on the right place. Yeah. So I'm just trying to accept those things. I, the other problem is that I think in Finland, my age people is always complaining about that they raised us to be nice. Mm. And there are a lot of emotions that we try to not see. And I, I think we are trying to learn them, learn out of them, and then like accept, accept those feelings also. But thank you. Yeah. Thanks. I, I, I think that uh, that comment kind of hi highlights a, a couple of useful things here. I, I, I think um, one thing about uh, like, <laughs> yeah, I, even though I think that, that anger goes together with self-respect, I'm, 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 I certainly wouldn't be against like counting to 10 before getting angry. At least I, I've forgotten about that. My, my parents used to say, you always have to count to 10 before you... <laughs> you know, before you kick that guy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, I think in a lot of, lot of cases where we have got a misplaced anger, it's, yeah. it's like if, if we took a little time to, to consider, well, did they actually mean to do that? Or does it actually make sense to, to express it this, in this way? Then, then, then we would actually be we would avoid those those situations, but but I think you're you're absolutely right that we shouldn't try to suppress these feelings, especially when they come up repeatedly or when they come up strong, and, and that there's and that, that the second point that 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 your comment highlighted is this cultural variation in these these norms of of feeling things and expressing those those feelings, and. Uh, so, so I'm I'm married to an an Irish woman, and uh, and so I'm very <laughs> aware of differences between the fi Finnish culture and and Irish culture, and and many 
others on, on these. And, and, I mean, certainly her feeling is that, that Finnish people hide their feelings quite a bit, and it can be difficult to tell what, what a Finnish person actually thinks about you or it's different in you know it's hard to, for me it's hard to tell what Americans are feeling because they're always so smiling and positive <laughs> and so there's many different ways of hiding your <laughs> negative emotions in in particular either you don't show any emotion like we do or you're smiling at everybody like like you guys do <laughs> excellent uh, so I, uh, we'll go here with the finger so remember the rule finger only if it's a follow-on uh, okay, uh, when I get angry or irritated, I I feel how I feel in my body. Uh, if there is some tension in some muscles like uh, uh, these the jaws or stomach or um, back, or my toes are. Uh, uh, like ready to uh, run or jump. Uh, I I try to relax, make these muscles relaxed, and keep them relaxed. And then then I uh, think uh, uh, fe uh, try, uh, I feel I try to f feel. Um, it's uh, difficult to explain in English, but I try to uh, uh, feel how, uh, w uh, if I'm still uh, irritated or angry, enough. Uh, if I, if I uh, feel that uh, this irritation and anger is, uh, is, not, uh, is still uh, so strong that I will not get, it doesn't go over, I will tell the person that I'm angry with uh, him or irritated or, uh, because of something. But I try, I try to usually uh, tell uh, it uh, calmly, like, like this. I'm angry with you. Well, sometimes I'm, I, 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 I am really angry and uh, you can... Uh, I let my feelings... Uh, I show my feelings. But many times, when I relax my body, this anger and irritation goes over, or it, I notice that it goes, uh, the level goes um, uh, lower, so low that I don't have to say anything. And so uh, many times I haven't have to uh, argue or fight with someone. Because in, uh, because of this uh, uh, way of relaxing my muscles. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, maybe just to follow up on that, uh, there's definitely this very strong dimension of physiological dimension to experience in emotions, and uh, uh, it's stronger in relation to some emotions than others. And uh, there's this, uh, with the kind of Euro-American thinking, we have this, uh, the, mind, the Cartesian mind-body split is, uh, has been so influential that it's, uh, uh, it guides our thinking uh, a lot. But uh, I definitely think that uh, soothing the physiological uh, response uh, of exp or exp physiological experience of emotion uh, is definitely one way of managing emotion and uh, then a lot of the for example in a kind of therapy uh, oriented talk a lot of the emphasis is on we need to focus on how we interpret the emotion so it's at that point where we start to deliberate about emotion is this actually something connected to something important and so on uh, but these two things the physiologi physiological dimension of it is of course important and uh, or they are like very much intertwined. And in relation to irritation, the physiological uh, dimension is very important and probably also con in connection to anger and anxiety as well, because we tend to be, we can definitely be more irritable when we are tired or hungry, for example. And I always like to, I love this example from one of the uh, interviews uh, we did for this research. Uh, this was a woman and we were talking about 
irritation between uh, her and her partner. And she said, like, and I asked her, what irritates you about your partner? And she said, well, on a good day, nothing. Uh, but if I'm hungry or tired, the way he breathes. So <laughs> just uh, pay, paying attention to the physiological dimension, uh, I think it uh, can be quite significant. Yeah, and, and if, I, if I may, as we, we chatted a bit about these things beforehand, and, and we talked about how in, in some other cultures, uh, for example, in uh, Indian philosophy, there's this long tradition of uh, like tying this sort of uh, in bodily uh, exercises with, with this sort of uh, philosophical self-control, uh, where you do, right, it has long been acknowledged that, that by, by influencing our, our bodily responses, we can influence the way that we, we think, the way that we see the world. Uh, and, uh, and I think there's a lot of truth to that, and, and this is a nice, nice example of, of one of those techniques. So there were some more hands up that were earlier, so maybe uh, Svetlana, and then we'll go over here to the man with the ponytail. Svetlana, right, right in front Thanks for a very interesting discussion. I have a question about the fully virtuous person. So if a fully virtuous person doesn't have negative emotions, how she's going to have empathy? So, so the, they do have certain negative emotions. It, it's just that they, they don't have all of them. I guess like envy, for example, wouldn't be the kind of emotion that, at least on many conceptions of, of the fully virtuous person, they, they don't, don't feel envy of other, other people. But they, they will feel, uh, say, compassion if, if somebody else is, is suffering. And that, that can be an important part of, part of virtue. Uh, what I guess that you know we've talked about one kind of, of one category of negative emotions. We we didn't talk so much about sadness and compassion and and, and this sort of responses in in our conversation. But uh, but they they are, they are also also important and also I think part of virtue to to have have those feelings. There also be differences. I mean, we've been focusing on. Aristotle's view about what a fully virtuous person is, uh, and that's going to that's gonna get you one answer to what emotions the virtuous person will experience. But if you look at uh, historical and contemporary virtue theory, you might come up with different answers. If Stoics have a theory of virtue where um, emotions aren't at all negative or positive part of the picture, the virtuous person, the sage, is not going to experience emotions. They're just going to have moral knowledge about what happiness and the good life involves, and that's what virtue consists in. Uh, a Kantian picture is gonna look different in, 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 in other ways. Uh, he's gonna think that some emotions are part of virtue, um, but it's gonna be a different set than what you get from Aristotelians. Uh, I think the next question is maybe over here with the man in the green. I think it's green. I can't see. All right. Thank you. A couple of questions. Uh, one about first about irritation. Uh, you were mentioning three different countries um, uh, uh, were included in your research. I was wondering if there if you found any notable differences in the way that people were irritated uh, towards one another. You even gave an example from China about high status uh, people, uh, but I was wondering if there are different ways in these like culture specific irritations or is it any relevant and the 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 thing about anger was that uh, do you know that in in Helsinki there is this rage room uh, I was wondering your your take on this do you think it's healthy do you think it should be encouraged? Uh, and would you accept the idea that maybe humans have some sort of like primal anger inside them that needs to be expressed? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, so for the pilot, uh, I was talking about our pilot data, which was in uh, China, Finland and the US. And uh, now we are actually starting a five year research project in Finland, China, Zimbabwe, Sri Lanka, Brazil. Wow. And uh, we will be do a comparative, like an extensive comparative study, 
drawing from anthropology and psychology. So I think I will, in five years' time, I will have a lot more to say about the cultural uh, differences. But uh, definitely, definitely, they were already in this pilot. Uh, it was very clear that its uh, experience of irritation is very culturally specific, and uh, especially. But this is kind of a. Uh, it's not surprising that the display rules, the way that emotion is displayed is very culturally specific, and also things that irritate us are very culturally specific. But maybe the more interesting question is uh, how does it, for example, map into different uh, to other uh, emotions, for example. And uh, even in this pilot, already we came across this issue, even when choosing the word what to use for irritation. So in Chinese, uh, the similar... the closest to the English equivalent of irritation that also has this uh, uh, dimension or emphasis on the kind of uh, external irritant, uh, the kind of impulse uh, a reaction uh, would be zizi. But this word could be negative, positive or neutral. So it can be a negative, it can elicit a negative uh, emotion of irritation, but also uh, it's a kind of stimuli uh, that elicits, uh, it can also be, for example, sexual uh, arousal or surprise, so it can be connected uh, to various things. So there's definitely uh, there's definitely lot lot of cultural variance here that I'll spend the next five years <laughs> exploring. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and uh, as to the, the the rage question, perhaps Charlie can say say more about the, the empirical facts here. I I, I feel like. I'm, I'm qualified at best to say something about when anger might be good and when it might be bad. Uh, but on the issue of whether it might, say, lead us to experience more of the positive kind or less of the negative kind if we, we go and break some stuff, I, 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 I don't have an informed view on that. What, what I do remember reading about is, is some research that suggests that uh, this sort of venting theory of, of uh, rage or anger is, is, is not correct. I, there's this sort of folk theory that if you express your, your anger or rage, then it, it, it then kind of the emotion dissipates and you, you, know, you become more, more calm and peaceful as a result. I do remember reading about some research that suggested the, the opposite, that, mm. that when we express these, these negative emotions, then it doesn't make them go away, but it just <laughs> generates more of them in the in the future. But but that's an empirical question that I'm I'm really not 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 qualified to. Do you, do you know of, of that I, research? I don't even know what a, a rage room is, except what I mean. Do are you are you provoked in the room? <laughs> like, is there somebody poking you with a stick, or do you just do you no. just go there to vent? No, there's like a bunch of stuff, bunch of items. You can pick something like a metal object and just really smash things. And just yeah. like let it really come to you. I I haven't gone there, but the I, idea. I, I, I mean, me. I think this is uh, entertainment uh, <laughs> rather than uh, emotional therapy. Uh, <laughs> maybe there's a context in which it could be therapeutic. Maybe, uh, maybe the Academy of Finland will give me some money to go and smash up stuff, and then <laughs> and we'll we'll see what what happens. Could you get an ERC or Academy of Finland grant <laughs> I'd, I'd for love this? to. Yes. <laughs> uh, next question will be Hane, and then there's a gentleman in the in the back over there. Thank you for an interesting discussion. Um, you all made a very st uh, strong case for the benefits of negative emotions, uh, but at the same time, you also focused on, I would say the immediate effects or immediate uh, benefits and perhaps long-term, even long-term benefits of these negative emotions. So I'd like to go back to the Stoics uh, and kind of challenge, perhaps this is to Antti uh, mostly, challenge, because you said that you, you don't agree with the Stoics. So um, insofar as I understand the, the argument or the reason why the Stoics wanted, uh, suggested that this cultivation of apathy or acceptance of anything, any fact, whatever it may be, was that in their view, uh, the overall life of a human being would, or that was the only way in which the human being could have a, compl 
a harmonious life as a complete life so that they weren't merely thinking about the immediate results of having uh, a strong emotion, whether positive or negative, but they were thinking about the human life as a whole. So my question would be, would you say that this kind of an idea of a life, this harmonious, apathetic life that the Stoics envisioned, uh, is simply not a feasible goal? Or would you say that that picture of a life is uh, something that ought to be avoided? Yeah, so I think that the one important strand, at least in the in the Stoic tradition, is is this uh, kind of universal determinism, uh, and they're kind of the they they if you assume that that we are not in control of of what happens outside of us, that we are only, I mean, it is a funny sort of determinism because it, it, it's not, not determinism in the contemporary sense because you're still meant to have this freedom uh, with respect to how you respond to events in the external world. It's just that you can't actually control them or, or, or influence them. So, uh, so one point of disagreement is that I, I, I don't believe in this, this type of determinism with respect to the external world. I mean, if it were true that we can't make a difference to, to anything that, that, that happens around us, then it, it would be, in a, in a way, there would be nothing to be gained by, by feeling bad about bad stuff happening. That, so that, that, that makes sense. Uh, another strand is, is this value theory that they had, which, which I, I do think is, is flawed. I, I think there, there are, there's a bunch of bad arguments that they, they give for the thesis that only virtue is good and, and only vice is, is bad. I, I think it's borderline incoherent because some of the virtues seem to presuppose, like justice, for example. Why, why would it be a virtue to have a certain distribution of, of the good or return good for good or whatever, uh, you know, if there weren't other things that, that are actually worth having for, for people? other than, than, than virtue, which can't be distributed like that. So, uh, so I think that my disagreement with the, with the Stoics comes from, from those kind of meta-ethical and, uh, and, and, and value-theoretical uh, issues, rather than this issue of, of, the, of the whole life. Uh, it's not that it's not an, an interesting question in, in itself, and I, I think it's something that is, is good to, to keep in view here, it kind of relates to, I, I think, to, to the, the previous question as well, because, um, because of this, how we cultivate our dispositions to have different emotions. Like it, so, so there's one question is like how, how you should feel in a, in a given moment, a given, given instance. But, but how we feel at, at, about particular events can generate dispositions to feel you know, in the same way in the future or... or at least that's what Aristotle believes, that we come to be certain kinds of people by doing certain things, feeling certain things about them. Uh, so, so, and we might not be mindful enough of the long-term effects of, of our, our responses, how they shape our lives as, as a whole going forward, as, as you said. So, so that, that might, might have a tendency to, to speak against the negative emotions, even if they might be fitting in a particular situation, if they make us the sort of person who, who tends to get angry or tends to be irritated about something, having those dispositions might be bad, even if it's if if it's appropriate on an individual occasion. So, did you want to add anything? Oh. I guess the only thing that I would add, uh, agreeing with much of what Auntie said, is that uh, I guess uh, a life well lived includes some disappointment. I mean, the successes aren't quite as rich if there weren't frustrations along the way. Uh, the significance of love isn't captured if there wasn't the broken heart that helps you appreciate the uh, fragility and, uh, and, uh, of, of relationships and their significance. Um, so I guess I think uh, the life well lived needs to have a mix of complicated and, and probably extremely e intensely experienced emotions um, 
the proportion needs to trend towards positive. Um, that, that I think also seems to be true. There's a question in the back next. Yeah, I wanna I wanna thank you all for such an insightful talk, first of all. Um, and I I started thinking about I think it was uh, Anni who talked about uh, irritation and uh, being irritated towards loved ones more when it comes to sort of mundane day-to-day -day things. And I started thinking because personally I find that um, I'm less irritated when loved ones chew with their mouths open, for example, or something like that. I find that I sort of let it slide. If it's somebody that's giving you something in exchange, such as love, a family member or a partner, or if it's somebody who's, who your relationship towards is something you want to preserve. Uh, whereas if it's somebody else, I find that um, like a friend or somebody whose relationship to you isn't that important, I find that... Um, you're not too worried about preserving it, so you're more likely to, to express your irritation or to feel, to embrace that irritation rather than let it go. So what I wanted to ask is, in the study or the experiment you mentioned about feeling more irritation towards loved ones, is it the fact that they're loved ones or is it the fact that uh, they're people we have more day-to-day -day contact with? It would be interesting if you could if we could have a study where, for example, we tested with long-term, uh, long-distance relationships, uh, see if we'd feel irritation towards uh, a partner or a brother or a parent, if they're not close to you, I would say that um, you would feel less irritation than when they'd be in your surroundings. So I'd like to hear all three of your thoughts on this. Yeah, uh, thank you. That's a really interesting question, and uh, definitely uh, it's complicated. <laughs> but I'm quite, I quite like this idea where you just vary the physical uh, distance. So uh, as a as a result, you vary the intensity of daily interaction, but you don't vary the emotional intensity of the relationship. So I think that's a really interesting idea, and uh, I'll bring it up <laughs> with my group. And uh, but I think. Uh, so there were, of course, other findings as well. Uh, so, uh, f for example, uh, when we are in close relationship with some uh, with people, there are other emotions there at play as well. So there are uh, things like loyalty, you know, uh, gratitude uh, that come into play as well in our mediate our experience of irritation with them. And uh, but there was maybe what I was referring to in relation to that particular point that I made was that, uh, for example, when people articulate their irritation, uh, so when they talk about their irritation, it was really striking uh, how when we get to, so we've been, for example, talking to people about their irrita experiences of irritation in relation to strangers, uh, to adult siblings and their spouses or partners. And uh, they didn't have that much to say about strangers, but once they get to the spouses, everybody just, uh, it was really elaborate, and uh, it varied between countries. Uh, so, for example, in Finland, it was a kind of light atmosphere. You kind of have to laugh about it a little bit and also say things like, oh, but he does so much, but, uh, you know. But uh, in, uh, in our Chinese interviews, uh, they were relating these uh, incidents of irritation to really quite fundamental uh, issues in a relationship of, for example, uh, inequity and uh, things like that. So, uh, I think maybe it's not so much that because, of course, we also have a more tolerance uh, when we know the backstory. So also our moral judgments are influenced by things like how we see intentionality. So uh, he does this thing or she does this thing, but she doesn't really mean anything bad by it. Whereas a stranger, it's more easier to think that, you know, they just uh, cut in front of us because they are inconsiderate as a person. Uh, or it was directed at me rather than they were just in their own thoughts or yeah so th these various things come into play uh but yeah thank you very interesting uh, idea i i have a 
a different suggestion for how to study this. I mean, that, I think I like that idea where you vary the the distance without the relationship, but you can also do it the, the other way around. Uh, I was in the army for 11 months uh, and slept for most of that time with 11 other men in the same room, and I was very irritated by <laughs> most of those people. <laughs> and so, so that was the situation where you're in, in close contact constantly with people you don't love, <laughs> but, but, but it does seem to me that that did generate a lot of irritation with their small little habits like waking up even before 6 a.m. Uh, <laughs> and waking you as well. I, mean, I still have some, harbor some grudges towards people uh, <laughs> in, in, in my, my room. <clears throat> uh, are there other questions? We'll go here. Any, any other hands? There? Thank you. Um, I had a question for Antti about anger. And um, you argued um, for the benefits of anger in um, kind of recognizing what you value or your values. And you mentioned the coral reef, for example. And I was thinking about like, could there be negative side on the motivational aspect of anger um, in the sense that it's maybe too like backwards looking. Um, that it might be kind of counterproductive to your goals if you're focusing on the kind of who did what and when and uh, kind of getting them to change the, their minds or so on, as opposed to kind of what would be the most effective way to, you know, preserve the coral reef. Yeah, I, I, I think that's an, that's an interesting question. It, I mean, I, I guess there could be situations where these sort of instrumental benefits and this sort of intrinsic value of, of, the, of the emotion can come apart, that it, it might be proper and, and fitting to value the coral reef in a way that entails wanting to punish people who, who did something in the past, even if it doesn't make any difference to future, and even if you could invest that effort into actually improving the situation of, of the reef or like preventing people from acting in that way in the, in the future. So in the, I, I think you're, you're right that it can be sort of instrumentally counterproductive to, to express the, the properly valuing emotion. Uh, another thing I wanted to say about that is, is that I think there are some kind of slight differences in, in the sort of anger that is kind of focused on some kind of ongoing norm violation and trying to get uh, people to stop doing things, to, to change what's, what's wrong right now, and then this sort of more backward-looking looking anger. Uh, and, and it could be, and I think it's quite plausible, in fact, that, that this sort of more forward-looking and present-directed anger, there's more to be said for that than, than for the backward-looking, purely backward-looking anger. Other questions from the audience, from the panelists? Uh, I do have a question about anxiety, actually. Yeah. And uh, to me, uh, how do you see in relation to, for example, depression or... Um, now I'm thinking from evolutionary perspective, what yeah. you were saying earlier about uh, one of the kind of functions of uh, anxiety is to, that it directs you to self, uh, for reflection and the kind of uh, turning inside. And that's the kind of evolutionary, one of the evolutionary theories of why, uh, why depression uh, has evolved. Yep. And uh, I think anxiety just generally is very interesting as an emotion because it seems to be uh, not so easily distinguishable or uh, it's more difficult to put a finger on it, uh, define it very clearly in relation to some of these other emotions. But at the same time, I don't know if this is specifically a Finnish uh, thing, but it mm. seems to be like a very uh, kind of a blanket uh, emotion that is used to refer to a wide range of uh, things. Uh, people often describe themselves as uh, just ha having anxiety or feeling anxious. And uh, yeah, so it's much used, but uh, it's not very clear, at least in everyday use, like what it actually encompasses and how it's connected to other emotions. Good, Annie. Um I think one of the challenges in studying anxiety, I mean, one of the challenges you face is how to translate emotion terms across cultures. One of the challenges I face in thinking about anxiety 
is that it's, it's a term or a word that has uh, clinical, uh, philosophical, uh, emotion researcher, as well as sort of ordinary non-academic uses. Uh, and that makes it very difficult to understand what we're talking about when we're talking about anxiety. Um, I think there's some the ways that you can try and tease that out by making distinctions between, for instance, I mean, one of the ways that anxiety seems to get used is to refer both towards an emotional state, so something that's sort of directed at a particular situation or issue uh, that's fairly short term in its duration. And we also use anxiety to, to talk about maybe a general behavioral dis or personality disposition or even maybe a mood. And so once we start making some of these distinctions, uh, then we can sort of fine-tune what we want to say about what's going on in those particular cases. And the story we tell about anxiety, the mood, is going to be different than what we tell about anxiety, the emotion. I think there also, I mean, there was another part of your question that was, uh, seemed to be pointing more towards, like, what's the relationship between anxiety and depression? And I think that that's a, a fascinating question, and it's sort of... Um, really interesting uh, relationships, problematically interesting relationships about the ways that it, uh, chronic or uh, persistent anxiety leads toward depression and how these two things uh, can go hand in hand. And I guess the way that I think about that is that um, we're anxious when we face uncertainty and we lack control. And as a result, when we're anxious, we tend to try and do two things. We try to minimize our risk exposure, and we try and gather information about what's out there. So we try and control, get some control of the things that we can't control, and we try and get information to address the um, uncertainty we have. But when we can't do either of those things, when we can't get more control, when we can't get more information, because of our situations, because of ourselves, whatever, that's when anxiety is going to start to trend pathological, when it's going to start to slide off into an anxiety disorder, when it's going to slide off into something like depression. Mm. Yeah. Actually, just to follow up very quickly on that, that, one thing I was thinking about, whether your three very nice cases of anxiety all involved the, the same emotion, especially the, the Atlantic editor case seemed quite different in this respect that he, he it didn't seem very much like he was gaining control or no. seeking information. <laughs> so it, 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 you know, you might, it's a different subtype of anxiety perhaps. Yeah, it's or, clinical. Yeah. I mean, he, I mean he, he is diagnosed with a, a suite of anxiety <laughs> disorders uh, and yeah. is, you know, successfully or making progress with regard to them. And so, yeah, that's exactly. I thought that there was one more hand up and maybe we'll take that question as our, Oh, so right here, um, and then uh, maybe this will be our, our last question. I just <clears throat> wanted to say thank you. I thought it was really interesting to hear about the upside or think about even the upside of these unpleasant feelings because I think culturally, in the Finnish culture at least, we've been taught, especially with anger and irritation, like I remember from my own childhood, like teachers, parents would be like, control yourself, like hilite it says. Like, you're supposed to keep it in, basically. But I feel like in the Finnish culture, uh, especially with anger, there's like a build-up. You know, like, it's like a, a boiling pot. Like, slowly, small things will get you angry, or small things will irritate you and make you angry. And then at some point, there's like a boiling point. And I was just wondering that... Um, like, is, it, is there an upside then? like we were talking before, to like actually showing small bits of like irritation or small bits of anger to not do like this whole boiling pot, pot yeah. like uh, reaction basically, that, that it doesn't all pour out in one go then, like you've been angry about like 15 different things for three years. And then, then one final thing, like a bus driver doesn't let you in and that's the explosion, <laughs> you know? So is there an upside to like kind of showing small bits of this emotion, like basically, I guess a question for both yeah. Anni and 
Yeah. I mean, I, I think that uh, listening to what Annie has to has to say and her her fascinating research on on irritation has kind of convinced me to think that this this is indeed uh, like I think you you were saying something about how this has this sort of preventive function and it it, it can kind of I think you you can get into a kind of escalation with irritation I. I in, in in certain social contexts, but I think it, it, expressing it when it when it's still at the boiling low <laughs> is it, probably better than I'm, I'm thinking of our our neighbor parking their car in under our window, which has irritated me for for a long time. And I'm just you know one day I'm gonna take a hammer or call the cops or whatever. But maybe I should just take take your advice and and go and say. You know, it irritates me that you parked the car there. <laughs> and it, it, it would probably be a more constructive way of dealing with these, especially these sort of re repeated sort of negative interactions. That, that Yeah, I think there's uh, definitely any experience of emotion always activates a coping mechanism. And coping mechanism can also be avoidance or just suppressing or passively observing the emotion. It can also be confrontation and that can be done in many different ways. So it matters how we, what's the coping mechanism that we kind of activate. And uh, for example, you can think about it in terms of if we share our negative emotion, uh, so if we display it to somebody, there's, for example, difference between unloading and offloading. So we can like unload the negative emotion by talking about it with somebody, uh, uh, somebody we are close to or somebody who is like involved in this event, uh, and then, or doing physical exercise or whatever works for, for a person. And then there's a case of offloading uh, where we just pass it on to somebody else, that negative reaction. So, for example, we've had a tough day, we go home and uh, we just act irritably and then we are offloading that negative load to somebody else. And uh, so we can think in those terms. And uh, something interesting, uh, kind of unrelated, but something uh, that I thought about when you were talking about this anger and irritation that you should keep in, it's quite, imp uh, and especially the, then the, this, uh, <laughs> when it just blows up. Uh, there's definitely a gendered dimension here too, and this is, uh, again, culturally specific, but uh, there's this image of uh, that women struggle to deal with irritation, so uh, the nagging, nagging women, uh, and then the men st struggle to deal with anger, so domestic violence, for example. So in, in the Finnish context, uh, this would be the gender dimension here. Uh, all of it very interesting. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Time for heippalappu. That's the <laughs> We've got a finger here. Um, yes, I was wondering if it would be possible for me to quickly jump on, us on that as well. Um, uh, you were talking about the gender dimension of emotions. Um, and you might have mentioned this already in the beginning, I zoned out for about five minutes because I got an email, apologies for that. Um, but I was wondering, when we talk about um, feelings and emotions and how appropriate they are, like given the gender of the person experiencing that emotion, for example, it's not often seen, seen appropriate for a woman to be angry, for example, uh, as opposed to irritated, as you already mentioned. I was wondering if there is kind of an element of resistance in the reclaiming of a certain emotion, for example, for a woman to feel rage um, and very kind of, uh, and express this rage in a very visible way. Um, there has been some talk about the kind of the feminine rage recently and how that looks like and how it actually looks like for a woman to be angry about certain things about their surroundings. Um, so yeah, not a very structured question, but if you have any closing remarks about that, that would be appreciated. I know that we are kind of running out of time here, but yeah. Uh, I, I just think it's a very valuable comment, I agree. Yeah. I, I mean, there's some really interesting philosophical work on this uh, by feminist scholars uh, talking about because of the situation that you just talked about where anger is um, not expected or tolerated by uh, women and minorities, that it makes it all the more powerful uh, because it's so counter-normative, right? That, uh, rage, anger in a woman is really disruptive uh, in, um, in ways that can be valuable in, in many of the ways that Auntie, Auntie was talking about. So if you want to, um, I can point you to some of that literature if you're interested in it. Yeah. 
Thank you very much. This has been a fabulous conversation. Thank you, Annie and Auntie. Uh, thank you, audience, uh, for your time and your questions. Uh, and uh, if you enjoyed this, two weeks from now, same bat time, same bat channel, uh, we can talk about literature and why, what the point of literature is. Not me, other, others. Okay, thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>